Uh, okay. So, yes, I know that, and and it's and so I'm sure that this talk, which is entirely about human subject experiments, has got to be an outlier for the discrete math seminar. But I gave Avi a choice of two talks, and the other one was a pure theory talk. So it's his fault, not my fault. Um, but but maybe it's not as off topic as it'll seem. So actually, um, the other time I gave a talk here was several years ago, and that was a, a primarily theoretical talk. And um, it, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that since it's related to today's subject. So for many years, um, I've been interested in um, social network models for strategic interaction. So I and many other people in the theoretical computer science community and some people in the AI community have been asking the question, well, if you've got some sort of um, strategic or economic interaction taking place that's mediated by a social network, for instance, meaning that players' payoffs are a function only of their own actions and those of their immediate neighbors in the network, but um, at equilibrium there can be propagation effects that affect distant parts of the network, um, a natural question to ask there is what's the relationship, uh, if any, between network structure and topology and equilibrium outcomes? So, for instance, if you have something like a simple economic trading game um, where parties basically can exchange goods but only with their neighbors and have utility for different goods, so on and so forth, you can kind of extend uh, classical um, microeconomic model results to such a setting and prove theorems along the line, um, uh, that, that prove theorems that basically give you precise relationships between structural properties of the network and who should be richer or poorer at equilibrium in such a game. And so I was working on these kinds of models for many years. And, um, you know, lots of the other work I do in learning theory, for instance, well, if you've got an interesting um, algorithm or idea there, there's an obvious way to test it out, which is to get some real data and try your algorithm and compare it to other algorithms. But, you know, in economics and related areas, I mean, these are actually theories about social behavior and social interaction. And so I became interested after studying these models for many years, well, are they any good, right? Do they actually predict human behavior? Um, and so you can only think of the experiments I'm going to describe today as sort of a mixture of, um, or at least being motivated by a mixture of topics from computer science to mathematical economics and game theory. And of course, there's a pretty healthy dose of behavioral game theory inspiration in these experiments. Uh, and I'll admit that the first one of these experiments we did, we've now done something like eight or nine sessions um, going back to 2006. Uh, the first session was, a, you know, we did it almost as a bit of a lark. Um, and the first session, as you'll see, was essentially a graph coloring game. Um, and after doing those initial experiments, so I kind of faced the decision, well, was this sort of a one-off joke or am I serious about this? And um, because if we were serious about it, we needed to completely destroy the sort of, um, you know, duct tape system that we'd put together and build a proper software platform. And so we've done that. And it's grown into, I think, a, a rather um, interesting extended project that's lasted many more years than I thought it might. And as you'll see, I've gained a lot of collaborators along the way who've, who've been um, invaluable in this work. But, but so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, let me start off with a somewhat dry slide that I think will just to set context and tell you kind of what happens in these experiments. So what I'm going to talk about today are a series of human subject experiments at the intersection of computer science, econ, sociology, and the field that for better or worse has started, started calling itself network science. In each of the experimental sessions I'm going to describe to you, subjects are brought in simultaneously in groups of about three dozen people. So we're bringing 36 people or so into a lab full of workstations down at the University of Pennsylvania. Each subject sits at a network workstation. And in every one of the experiments, all a subject has to do or can do in each experiment is control some simple property or state of their vertex in some underlying network structure that we have exogenously imposed on the subjects. So we're sort of putting them in an artificial social network whose structure we are choosing and which I'll say much more about that structure as we go through it. And in each one of these games or sessions, subjects really only have a local view of the activity in the network. So um, think, think of something like graph coloring as a concrete example. All you have to do at each moment in time is choose a color for your vertex from some fixed vocabulary of colors. 
Um, there, are gonna, there are real payoffs, so in the spirit of behavioral economics and game theory, where your experiments are not taken seriously unless you actually pay subjects in accordance with their performance. So if you just pay them for participation, who knows what their real motivation is in the experiments. The belief is if you pay them exactly what they earn under some well-defined incentives, then you know, people you know, largely being greedy will behave according to those incentives. So you might imagine in graph coloring, you just cho choose a, a vertex for your, for a color for your vertex. You're going to be paid if and only di your, if your color differs from your neighbors when time expires. Um, and, and you only have a local view of the activity at each moment. You can see your color and the color of your surrounding neighbors. And you know, um, I won't go into detail, but we follow fairly rigorous um, you know, methodology here in terms of putting up physical partitions in the room full of workstations so that it's very difficult to see anything but your own terminal. And in any case, even if you could see other terminals, um, there's no relationship between physical proximity in the room and your position in the network, so on and so forth. Okay? Huh? The Helsinki, uh, right, right, right. Or Stockholm, as, as the case may be, right? Uh, depending on your view, view, viewpoint, I, I viewpoint of the experiments. Of yeah. yeah. By the way, as a, by the way, but feel free to interrupt with questions and comments. Um, in, in many ways, this talk kind of gives itself. I find in that that people are always have questions about you know things we didn't try and what might have happened, and and I get good experimental ideas from that. So. In, I've given this talk many times and I never finish it, so it's kind of actually relaxing and relieving because I, I don't even need to intend to. The, by the way, on this topic, though, of, of, of torture, um, these subjects actually have to have institutional review board approval and go through basically the same procedure that you would go through if you wanted to do a clinical trial of a drug, for instance, which I thought was somewhat of a joke until when I told Prabhakar Raghavan about these first experiments and I said, oh, I'm you know, seeing if human subjects can color graphs, and he says to me, Mike, you're a cruel, cruel man. Um, but anyway, across these many different experimental sessions, we've been deliberately varying two major design, you know, design variables, which are what the network structure is and what the game being played is. We've, we twiddle around with other things as well, but as you can see, just the you know, sort of design space of all the different network structures you could impose on 36 subjects and all of the different games they could play is sufficiently large that we tried to mainly focus on these two, these two um, design variables and their interaction. You'll see that the network structures we've chosen are largely, although not exclusively, inspired by generative models that people have been proposing in the mathematical sociology and other literatures to explain certain commonly observed structural properties of social networks, such as a heavy tailed degree distribution, for instance. So some of you might be familiar with kind of the literature on small worlds networks, on preferential attachment, so on and so forth. And the problems that we've chosen or the games that people have been playing We've mainly chosen for diversity in a couple of dimensions. One is sort of cooperative versus competitive games, which you might broadly think of as can we all simultaneously achieve our maximum possible payoffs, or does the game have the property that if I'm making a lot, others by definition must be making less? Um, and also, um, you know, because I, I come from a theoretical computer science background, we've also been you know, looking to deliberately populate the landscape of problems that we look at vis-a-vis um, -vis their difficulty, let's say, according to complexity theory, which, of course, only has a glancing relationship to these experiments in many ways because, first of all, n equals 36 here, and also our subjects have the difficulty of solving the problems in a distributed fashion from only local information um, versus, let's say, the centralized um, uh, uh, view of computational complexity. So yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get to these details, but basically, yes, we we made sure that what we we we, we sure we basically in the coloring experiments we've done, we've made sh we've given them a number of colors equal to the chromatic number of the graph. Okay. And why did you um, ask them to choose the colors different from what they would have done if they together? Oh, because it's 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 the actual formal graph coloring problem where the goal is to find a coloring of the vertices such that the colors on each end of every edge are different. But we've also looked at consensus, okay. um, which is the, and we've looked at these together, and I'll say more about that as we go. Okay. 
Okay, so you know there are many, many goals and many, many interesting questions one can ask about these experiments, and we've tried to think and, and study many of these or all of these. Um, so one, of course, is how does the performance or behavior you see of human subjects depend on the structure of the graph, the problem in question, so on and so forth. Um, being somebody um, who is also a machine learning researcher, I'm interested in really the problem of individual and collective modeling, i.e. doing things like taking the experimental data from these behavioral experiments and using them to predict, what, to not just model what happened in sample, but to try to predict what might happen in novel situations, novel networks, novel problems, so on and so forth. Um, and, and I won't say much about it in this talk, but I can talk to people offline afterwards. You know, this, this is sort of a challenging problem for traditional machine learning and machine learning theory, right? We're not, we're usually not used to thinking about modeling sort of sociological behavior in this way, and so there's some interesting theory questions there as well. Of course, you know, we're definitely interested in what, stand, what existing computational and equilibrium theories predict about these experiments and how close they are to what actually happens or not. Um, and the other quick comment I'll make is that um, one thing that's nice about these, there are many limitations to these kinds of controlled experiments, and they're very labor intensive, right? I mean, it's very, if you've ever been, if you've ever participated in human subject experiments, it's difficult even if you're only bringing pairs of people into play prisoner's dilemma, for instance, to sort of manage 36 subjects simultaneously and not only that build the system to do this work is, is a lot of work, but one benefit you get from it is a high degree of control and you can ask counterfactual questions, right? So many of you might have seen the many, many papers over the last decade that litter the pages of science, nature, PNAS, and journals like this, where basically researchers have gone off and gotten some large existing data set on social interaction, like the entire network of instant message exchanges um, on everybody who uses Microsoft IM, for instance. And of course, they then report on things like, well, here's what the network structure looks like. You have these individuals with an extraordinarily high degree of connectivity, so on and so forth. But in such data sets, you can't really ask the question, well, you know, are these people important? What would happen if they didn't exist in the network? Well, you know, if you removed them, would somebody else then play that role? Would the network seek to function? So on and so forth. So one great advantage of experiments like this is this fact that you can, you can ask these counterfactual questions by just changing the experimental scenario. Okay? Okay, so I don't expect you to read this slide, but this basically gives you a list of the experimental sessions we've done to date. Um, and then for each one, I sort of tell you what the problem we're solving is, what the player controls, such as in graph coloring, you control the color of your vertex, and the number of choices you have is equal to the chromatic number. Consensus, on the other hand, you're controlling the color of the vertex, and your goal is to agree with everybody. And I'm telling you a little bit here about what the payoffs are. Um, and the payoffs here are designed to you know, basically match the name of the game that I'm giving here in the sense that the maximum welfare states kind of correspond to the collective problem being solved. Yes? Um, so in each experimental session, which lasts about two hours of, of experimentation time after prep and explanation, so on and so forth, we'll typically divide the evening into a bunch of short experiments, like one or two minutes, okay? No, no, no. So within a, within a two-minute, let's say, graph coloring experiment, everybody, it's complete asynchronous update. Everybody can change their color as often as they want to, whenever they want to, and whenever somebody changes their color, it'll immediately update um, uh, you know, their view and the view of their neighbors. Okay? Did you say two minutes or two hours? Two, two minutes. No, that's two minutes. Like two yeah. So we, and we, by the way, we've systematically pushed... Right, so, so in a given two hour session, it'll be the same 36 subjects, but they'll be playing a series of many, many short one or two minute games. In the same network? Or no, in a different network each one or two minute game, but we'll also, and I won't go into great detail about these things, but of course, we also think about repeatability, right? So we have to balance wanting to do lots of exploration of the design space, but we'd like to also have some hope of getting statistically significant results. And so we might run the same network several times in a series of you know, 90 two-minute experiments. Um, but this, the subjects never know what the networks are, right? They only, they only, you'll see they only have a local view. And so they only know what they can infer about the global structure from their local view. Yeah? I was wondering if you <coughs> find any sequential effects, like the experiments, the results that you see an hour and a half 
It's a good question. So one of the things we're always interested in, sometimes because we're interested in it in its own sake and sometimes we're worried about it, it having a confounding effect on other findings, we always look for learning behavior. We always look for adaptation. And my, my broad summary would be, you know, every one of these things is different and has its own details. But my broad summary would be, would be we generally don't see it. We generally see very, very little change in, let's say, the payoffs being achieved or even individual level strategies um, through, you know, as the night goes on. Okay? Okay, so, you know, so we've done things like graph coloring. We've done what you might think of as its dual where rather than, so you can think of graph coloring as, a, as the problem of social differentiation. In fact, when we wrote this paper, um, the, with the editor of the journal sort of said, well, you know, this is very interesting and the reviewers like it, but I really want you to think hard about a simple example where a general audience could immediately understand what graph coloring means. And, you know, you kind of can't sort of trot out, well, exam scheduling in universities where the graph is. So I basically gave the, I offered the example of cell phone ringtones, right? Um, you know, there's a limited menu. If, at least if you use the cell phone ringtones that come installed on your phone, there's a limited vocabulary of choices. You'd like your ringtone to be different from the people you spend a lot of time around so there's not confusion about whose, whose phone is ringing, okay? Consensus, on the other hand, is, a, is sort of the dual where you're trying to get social agreement. Um, we've looked at um, independent set, a trading game, biased voting. Last year we did network bargaining. But so in every one of these cases, right, um, there's, a, there's sort of simple local controls. There are payoffs at the, at the player level, which incent them collectively to try to find, you know, a coloring, an independent set, um, you know, global consensus, so on and so forth. And you can also see, you know, those of you from a theoretical computer science background, the variation in terms of computational complexity of these problems in the limit of, of large size or large instances, you know, it, it runs the gamut from things that are completely trivial, like consensus, just assign every vertex to red and you're done, to things like graph coloring and um, independent set, which are not only intractable, but it's intractable even to find poor approximations to optimality. And then there are things in, in the middle, like exchange economy. This is an interesting one from a complexity standpoint in that you can complete, you can compute equilibrium prices in this model, um, but it requires sort of using linear programming as a subroutine, and that doesn't seem like it's likely to be gotten rid of. So if you think of you know, things that really need linear programming as being in P, but sort of just barely, or they're sort of using the full power of P, this is something at that intermediate level of difficulty, okay? So obviously, you know, there's a lot to say about each one of these individual sessions, and I'm not gonna try to talk about all of them here. What I wanna do in the talk is just um, pick a few of these and just give you a, a, a more concrete feeling for what these experiments are like, what kinds of questions you can ask about these experiments, and what, what sort of findings look like? You know, what, what, do, what do results look like um, uh, resulting from these experimental sessions, okay? So um, what I'm going to do, time permitting, is say a little bit about sort of coloring and consensus experiments, say a little bit about um, our biased voting experiments that were sort of inspired actually by the um, hotly contested Obama-Clinton primary campaign of a couple of years ago. And then uh, if I have time at the end, I'll say a little bit about um, our experiments in independent set. We have a question over the time. Okay, so you, know, to, to, you tell me when you get hungry or tired and, 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 and we can just break and continue over lunch or something. Okay, um, so we did two sessions of coloring and consensus experiments. Um, the initial one back in 2006, um, and then a later one, which we, and, and those were coloring only, graph coloring only. And then we did a later set of experiments directly because we were interested in this contrast between coloring and consensus, which are sort of easily phrased duals of each other, but complexity theory would say they're very different, and so we were interested in what the behavioral response would be like. Um, so I'm mean, gonna sort of mix stories from these two sessions together, and, and then I'll have one slide where I kind of summarize what some of the findings are. So first of all, just to you know, put you in the position of a subject, this is what a typical screenshot would look like from the, the, of the GUI um, if you were a participant in one of our experiments. So um, what we have here is sort of a main display area where you're seeing your local network structure. So there's always a vertex in the middle clearly labeled U. This is your vertex. 
you see your neighbors, and we're also showing you the edges between your neighbors. Okay, so this is what um, sociologists would sometimes call the ego network because it's all about you and the connections between you and your neighbors. Um, another thing you might call is just the first neighborhood view. So you're basically seeing the induced network just on your local neighborhood. Okay, and so you can see you're seeing your color, you're seeing the colors of your neighbors. Um, the only thing that's interactive in this interface is this panel down at the bottom where, again, asynchronously, anytime you want, you could click on one of these buttons and change your color, which would then cause your color to be updated in your neighbor's views. And anytime they do the same, you would see an update of your colors. Um, these numbers you see, which happen in this um, canned screenshot to be all zeros, would in general have non-zero numbers. And what they're showing you is basically the number of neighbors that your neighbors have other than the ones that you see. So in other words, if you saw a plus two here, that would tell you that this particular neighbor of yours has two other neighbors that you can't see. Okay? And you know, if this one really had a zero, it would mean that you see all of its neighbors, and so on and so forth. Okay? So our, our, our sort of motivation here, our justification of this particular interface is that I, I think our view is that this is the max, in a real social network, this is the maximum we might hope that you would be able to articulate about your social network reliably. Hopefully you could reliably list your close friends if I gave you a prop, pr proper definition of that. Hopefully you could have a pretty good idea of which of your friends were friends with each other. And you might also have some sense of how popular your friends were, which is the sort of proxy for the degree values here. But our view is that you, while you might reasonably be able to approximate all that information, if I ask you to list all of your friends' friends and all the relationships between your friends' friends, I think most of us would have no hope. Okay? So this is what the interface looks like. This is what the action panel looks like. Um, we, we usually have a bar at the top which tells them how much time is remaining in the game. And we usually um, have some notion, uh, that's this bar down here, and we have something which reminds them what the payoff structure is. And we sometimes included a progress bar, which told them, told you how much, how close the, the collective was to a solution without really telling you what that solution might be. In the case of coloring, that's easy. You can just sort of give something which tells you how many edges still have conflicts on them, for instance. Yes? Yeah, and we don't do that here. It would be an entirely reasonable thing. In fact, you know, um, many, many, there, there are many, many reasonable things that we just haven't tried, not because they're not reasonable or, in fact, quite interesting and thought-provoking, but just haven't, you know, we, we haven't had time. You know, on that point, one comment I'll make is that we're always struggling between the trade-off between sort of taking something we've already done and drilling down even deeper on it once in, in light of the findings so far versus sort of taking a shotgun approach to just sort of try to populate this vast landscape of experimental designs with some data points. We generally opted towards the latter rather than the former, but I hope someday this research matures enough and has enough other people doing similar things that there might be that, that kind of drill down. Okay. Um, what else? Okay, so this is, what, this is what the interface would look like. And of course, for the different problems we've done, it's all been slightly different and the incentives are different. But, but largely speaking, this is a very common type of view that a subject would have. Now, um, let me just kind of, you know, uh, give you a little bit more of a sense of what actually happens in some of these experiments without even talking about sort of statistically meaningful results yet. So in our very first session of coloring experiments, um, in every experiment, the underlying network imposed on the subjects was, at, was one of the six networks shown in front of you. So it was ex only the, exactly these six networks, and each of them was repeated several times, um, including under other conditions that we vary that I haven't mentioned to you, but, but we'll say at least about one of them shortly. Um, so you can think of these, you can really think of these networks, as, and again, I remind you, you're seeing a layout here that none of the subjects had the luxury of seeing. All, if you were subject to the experiments, you're just a point in one of these networks, and all you're seeing is your local view in that network. You know nothing about the global structure whatsoever. Okay? So for instance, in the simple cycle, the experiment would start, and all you would see is that you have two neighbors. 
and you wouldn't even know that there was a sense of clockwise versus counterclockwise to those two neighbors. And in particular, you wouldn't know what anybody else was seeing. For all you knew, you know, the, I mean, so in particular, you couldn't distinguish yourself from being here in this network versus here in this network, okay? And you knew nothing about the network structure in general. So the first sort of family, if you like, of networks across the top here are inspired by these models who've been studied by people like Strogatz and Watts, these sort of small world models that are meant to sort of simultaneously explain why in real social networks you have both small diameter and kind of high clustering coefficient, as it would be called in, in sociology, meaning that your, your neighbors are likely to be connected with each other. Um, so these are, this is sort of a simple cycle. This is a cycle with five random cords cutting across it, and this is a cycle with 20 random cords cutting across it. Um, this is... How is, uh, oh, how is this graph related to small ones? No, no, no. The first three are really... Why are they related to small ones? Um, so okay, so, so in general, um, you, you know, in the real small worlds models, you'd, ha you'd add some additional local connectivity here. Like, you'd be connected not just to your immediate neighbors on the cycle, but the ones two and three away. So that's what gives you the high clustering. And then when you sort of replace some random fraction of that with random chords instead, you simultaneously get the small diameter and retain, you know, a fairly high clustering coefficient so as well. That's right. So good. Right. So we wanted to um, maintain the two color ability while still getting the small world property. And so we basically restricted the random edges to only be between sort of um, alternate parity, uh, opposite parity indices. And I guess one of those things that you didn't drill down is what happens if you put them in the odd cycle. Uh, no, we didn't try that. Yeah, we didn't try that. Um, you know, th this, we, th this is an example of something we'll typically do, which is we'll have sort of one um, kind of organically generated, if you can think of these as that uh, network series of network structure inspired by some well-studied model like w uh, small worlds models. And then we'll throw in something which is highly engineered, right? So this is a cycle where we pulled two of the vertices into the middle and made them kind of leader vertices in that they have extremely high degree. And you can ask yourself, what, you know, what do you think should happen here and what do you think should happen up here? These two networks are um, preferential attachment networks varying, um, you know, which those of you who know that is this sort of rich get richer generative process where at each step you add a new vertex to the network and add several new edges to that um, vertex. But the, um, the, you draw the new neighbors for the new vertex um, from a distribution that's proportional to the current degree distribution. So, those, those vertices that already have high degree are preferentially advantaged to get even higher degree. And these were, these, this network model was primarily introduced to um, generate power law degree distributions to sort of explain, if you like, the uh, observation of power law degree distributions in networks, okay? So, so we actually generated these, in, in these cases, we actually generated these by, by, you know, choosing randomization and generating networks according to those models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, definitely in the sense that if you looked at the actual degree distribution here, you could, even at 36, you could firmly um, exclude the possibility it was generated by Erdős Renyi, for instance. There's just no, you just wouldn't have these vertices, which, you know, in some cases here, the, you know, half of the vertices are your neighbor, like you have a degree 18, right? Okay, so, um, you know, for fun, let me show you uh, a couple of home movies, if you like, of actual behavior. Um, this come up, takes a second. Um, so what you're going to see here, and I think this is sped up a couple of times real time, but here you see subjects entering. They're initially, initially their color is undefined, and to enter the game they actually have to actively pick one or the other of the two available colors. Um, the, the black edges here, which are meant to be easier to see, are where there's a conflict, okay? And so you see basically people, first of all, exhibit variation in when they actually enter the game and pick a color. And then you have, you know, 
um, from your bird, the bird's eye perspective, there's a pretty clear problem that has to be worked out here, right? You can actually, um, one of the things that's appealing about such a simple network is there's an, an almost mathematical inevitability to what has to happen here in order to solve the problem. If you think of each of these conflict edges as a particle, right, these conflict edges have to be propagated until they can meet another conflict edge and therefore cancel each other out, be resolved by the player in the middle of those two conflict edges, okay? And, and of course, the subjects don't know that. They have no idea that they're playing this game in a cycle. And so it turns out that this category of networks is actually, this, the, the simple cycles are the most difficult of the six networks I showed you for the subjects to color. And you can see that even though they have no bird's eye view and have no idea what's really going on elsewhere, you can still see evidence of you know, sh um, local attempts to purposefully propagate a conflict in one direction or the other, clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's sort of easier to see rather than watching it in real time is if I grab the uh, slider here and, and sort of move it back and forth in time, you can definitely see there are significant local periods where the conflicts are moving purposely in a clockwise or counterclockwise way. The problem, if you like, is that there's no coordination, right? So, you know, you know two two conflict edges might be sort of chasing each other around the cycle rather than being propagated in a meaningful way towards each other, okay? Um, and you might imagine that the behavior would be very different if everybody did have a bird's eye view of this network on, uh, on which I will comment um, in a slide or two, okay? Now, and so this is sort of what happens in simple cycle, and this is an example where after a full, in this case, five minutes, because these were the very first experiments we ever ran, and one concern we had is that just, you know, we had no idea, can people do this sort of thing at all, right? Take 36 people into a room and give, give them graph coloring problems. I mean, maybe it's gonna take them hours to even make progress on a single network. So we gave a five minute time limit of the initial experiments and then we gradually cut that down as we become more and more confident that people can, can do these kinds of things. But this is an example of an experiment that after five full minutes was still pretty far from, from, a, from a solution, okay? In contrast, you know, here's a, at least from a layout perspective, a considerably more complicated looking network, which is the preferential attachment, the dense preferential attachment network over on the right. And here, you know, again, if you think about it from an algorithmic perspective, you know, sort of a distributed computation perspective, what needs to happen is a little bit different. Um, these high degree vertices or hub vertices in the middle, right, they all have the experience that almost as soon as the experiment starts, the four available colors, this has a chromatic number of four, are immediately used up by their 18 neighbors or so. And so they, they have no choice but to conflict with some subset of their neighbors. And all they can really do by changing color is switch the conflict from one set of their neighbors to another set of neighbors. So the hope here, right, is that what would happen is that these conflict, you know, that the, um, what tends to happen, and this is anecdotal from staring at these things for too many hours, but what tends to happen is that these high degree vertices tend to exhibit higher stability, right? They'll kind of pick a color and fix on it and hope that their neighbors can work it out. And working it out largely consists of the conflicts propagating from these high degree vertices that happen to be in the middle of the layout to vertices like this, which you might, you might think of this as a, a fixer vertex, right? Because this is a degree three vertex in a four colorable graph. So any conflict that arrives at this party, they'll always be able to resolve it. Yes? Um, do, they, do they know that the structure is not colored? They did, they did know that. In these experiments, we told them that it's possible to, to find a proper coloring. Okay, so there was a welfare state where everybody could get paid, yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, in fact let, me, I mean, let me see if I'm going to say something about that on the next slide, and if not, I'll say something about it now. Um, yeah, so, so in almost every experiment that we run, we will put some effort into thinking about simple behavioral models, um, simple local dis algorithms um, whose distributed behavior could explain or recapture salient parts of the su observed subject behavior. So a natural thing to do is to pick some little heuristic for local coloring, run it on the actual networks that I'm showing you here, and see if you can at least reproduce the order of difficulty that the subjects found. So what I can say about that in these experiments is consider the following heuristic. Um, suppose the heuristic is if you don't have a color conflict at a given time step, do nothing. 
if you have a color conflict, you're the same color as one of your neighbors, and there's an available color that you could switch to and not have a conflict with any of your neighbors, then switch to such a color. And if conflict is inevitable, meaning your neighbors are already using up all the colors, then um, you know, occasionally pick a random color just to introduce some, some perturbation. So this seemingly reasonable heuristic more or less um, reproduces the opposite order of difficulty found in the human subjects. So whatever the subjects are doing, it's quite different from that particular heuristic. Yes, um, and, and, and in fact, again, I don't have time to show you, but we have an exit survey in every experiment in which among, amongst more specific questions, we ask, just ask, what did you try? Um, in fact, I have a slide here that's, I'm not, that's hidden, but, but basically in these particular experiments, um, there were a lot of comments along the, there were a lot of sort of simulated kneeling kinds of comments. So a lot of people reported that when it seemed like nothing was happening and they'd reached some sort of local stasis, they would just sort of randomly change colors in order to either wake their neighbors up or to just try to get out of a local minimum. Of course, they didn't use that language. Um, many of them report. Um, in some cases, yeah. In some cases, yeah. They, when they, they said that sort of seems like nothing's happening and the game, you know, and, and they don't have a payoff yet, they would, they would engage in this kind of behavior. I, I think for the, the huh? So I don't know if, they rep if anybody self-reported changing their behavior when they didn't have a conflict, but you can see instances of it in the data, certainly. Yeah, well, we'll rem uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's much of that actually, right? I mean, one of the reasons that it's interesting to do these experiments is that people, you know, th as in the rest of behavioral economics and game theory, people deviate from rationality, right? Sometimes with sort of well understood reasons, other times not. People also reported engaging in all kinds of signaling behavior, some of it quite subtle. So some people reported toggling back and forth between two colors just because they thought one of their neighbors wasn't being sufficiently attentive. Other people reported toggling back and forth between two colors to say to their neighbor, well, basically I could play red or blue and not have a conflict, and so I'm going back and forth between red and blue to let you know that. So in case you would, it's better for you that I be one or the other, you, you can realize that and act on it. Okay. There is not clear evidence that any of these signaling mechanisms were actually understood by the intended recipients and acted on. But you can definitely go to look at the data and see instances of it. I mean, on that point, um, in the second ses session of experiments, um, we, we used a much more controlled or much more limited set of networks. And we looked at coloring and consensus problems together on the same set of networks. So first, let me tell you a couple of words about what the family of networks was. So we basically. Um, used a generative model um, for networks, which basically starts off as a chain of six cliques of size six who, that are loosely coupled by each clique having a, a leader, if you like, that has you know, um, a left and right neighbor, which is another leader of, a, of an adjoining tribe. So you can think of this as you know, a model, a sort of a, a mathematical model of a highly tribal society in which you've got these six little groups um, each of which can communicate, but only in sort of a very weak fashion through a leader. Now, of course, the leader, again, nobody knows anything in these networks. They don't know about these cliques. They don't know about the existence of a leader that has connections to other clique leaders, so on and so forth. So start with this network and introduce a parameter P, which is a, a probability. And what you do is you go around to all of the internal clique edges. And for each one, with probability 1 minus P, you leave it there. And with probability p, you basically rewire it to a random destination in the network. So you would say, pick this edge. And if you selected it to be rewired, you'd pick one of its two endpoints. And you'd delete the edge between these two guys, pick one of the two endpoints at random, and then connect that guy to a random vertex chosen among all, all 35 other participants. Okay? So like lots of these generative novel, uh, models, this gives you a knob where when p equals 0, the network is literally what you see here. And when P basically becomes large, you're, you're essentially moving towards erdos Reni, right? When P equals 1, the original network structure I'm showing you here is a red herring and is, is overwhelmed by just the, the random long distance connectivity, OK? So basically, um, we generated a family of networks for, with several different values of P that we sampled. 
and, and, and looked at the resulting behavior. These images, um, just to again give you sort of an anecdotal feeling of what happens in these experiments, um, these are images showing the actual temporal behavior of all 36 subjects in an experiment. So what you have here is time in the game going across the x-axis here, and you have a row for each of the 36 players, and the color in a row is just what color that player was playing at that time in the experiment. And these are all images from maybe not when p is equal to zero, but small values of p. So values of p um, like, you know, zero or 10% rewiring, where the clique structure that I'm showing you is still largely intact, okay? And then what I'm showing you, I, I've deliberately grouped the rows by the clique structure, right? So the first six here were all in one clique or near clique structure. The next six here were in another near clique structure, so on and so forth, okay? This is, this is now, now we're looking at consensus, exactly. So you can kind of immediately read off all kinds of interesting individual and collective behavior from these diagrams. So first of all, at the collective level, you generally see that, you know, at the beginning people are choosing all kinds of colors. Then the clique structure very, very quickly takes effect, and you start to see blocks of six all adopting the same color, even though different blocks of six might be adopting different colors. In a typical low P experiment, after not too long, you really get down to just two or three colors. And now you have this sort of battle or, or coordination problem, right? You might have half, one half of the network that's you know, sort of all settled on red, and the vast majority of the participants on that side of the network see only red in their neighborhood. So why would they change anything? On the other side of the network, you have everybody seeing yellow, and then you just have a couple of players that can actually see that there's not global consensus yet. Okay? And somehow those couple of players need to communicate this to the entire population. So, you know, certain cases seem to get resolved pretty easily and, 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 you know, this is the end of the experiment when consensus was reached in yellow. Other cases are more complicated. Um, this one was the only one out of 18 such experiments that didn't actually end within two minutes at global consensus. And you can see very kind of interesting and amusing dynamics here. Pretty quickly, you know, they settled down to um, a largely orange piece of the network, um, another part that's this darker blue, and then this sort of aquamarine color in a single uh, clique of size six. At some point, that clique of size six gives it up and very abruptly switches over to the blue, but not just before, in fact, they manage to have a trickle of influence um, throughout the other part of the network that actually then goes and takes hold, and so you actually, between kind of this point in time and this point of time, you have kind of a complete reversal. And by the end, actually, it's still 50-50 between these two colors and no consensus was reached. You can also see sort of very rich acts of signaling going on, right? So here is sort of clear signaling behavior. This is likely somebody in one of the brown, one of the brown cliques that can see the presence of this yellow clique up there and is trying to inform their neighbors, which may or may not have resulted in the adoption of yellow here. Um, you see sort of um, parties that, you know, these are people, they can do whatever they want. They're, they're rapidly cycling among all the available colors here in a short period of time. Um, by the way, one, one slight digression. Um, one, of my, one of our biggest fears in running these kinds of experiments is that some detail of the interface or the structure of the game that we overlooked will completely trivialize the behavior and we won't learn it until we're in the actual experimental session and thus waste months of work and planning and coding, et cetera. We came close to that in these experiments because, um, you know, a few weeks before the experiments, my collaborator Stephen Judd came in to me and said, you know, um, first of all, in these experiments, like in the consensus experiment, there's no obvious number of colors to choose the way there is in graph coloring, right, where you can choose the chromatic number. So here we arbitrarily chose nine colors as sort of a sufficiently large and challenging number to reach consensus on. And so Stephen Judd came in to me and said, well, you know, what if just by chance in the first experiment, they happen to all reach consensus by choosing red eventually? And he said to me, what do you think they're going to do at the start of the second experiment? and the third experiment, and the fourth experiment. In other words, the first experiment establishes a social convention, and then, you know, these are undergraduates who would rather be out partying rather than sitting in my dull experiments. They're just going to, you know, take all of my money by, by just picking red the rest of the night, and we'll have sort of no interesting data. So luckily, Stephen thought of that, and of course, the way we solved it is by a randomization scheme, whereby what actually looks like red to me 
looks like blue to Avi and green to Rob, where the real colors really are the integers one through nine. And then everybody at the beginning of every experiment has a different randomly chosen mapping between those integers and the visible colors. And so everything's consistent locally, but we can't, it breaks the possibility of establishing any sort of social convention. And so I'm always worried, um, especially since that example, that, that we're going to miss something and, and blow it one of these times. Um, okay, so um, you can go read the papers for some of the you know, more rigorous results rather than the little stories I'm telling you. But let me, let me tell you the kinds of findings one can make from these experiments other than just sort of generating pretty pictures. So first of all, um, one thing that I think wasn't obvious until we started doing this stuff, and this holds true not just of these coloring and consensus experiments, but many others as well, is that people are quite good at doing these things, right? At least at the scale we're doing them, three dozen people on networks of complexity analogous to the ones you're seeing here and many other network structures I'm not showing you, um, people do well, okay? So one particular measure of that is, remember, we know in advance every network we're going to give them, and we can also compute the maximum social welfare configuration of any network. So we can basically say, um, in these ones, it's, it's easy, right? Because in all these experiments, everybody can get paid the maximum amount. They can, it's possible for everybody to be a different color. But in other, in other ones where it's a, a problem of finding a max independent set, um, you have to kind of go do some calculation. But we can compute in advance the maximum social welfare configuration for every network we're going to give the subject and therefore compute what the maximum actual dollar cost for us in subject payments would be for every experiment. And we can compute, therefore, sort of a measure of a social efficiency. We can say what fraction of the maximum this, these experiments could have cost us was actually taken by the students, was actually realized by the subjects. And that figure averaged over all of the experimental sessions we've done so far. It's basically in the high 80%. Okay? So um, people seem to be able to do quite well at this collective sol problem solving from distributed only local information. Um, one interesting thing about the second session of experiments that I describe, um, which again, maybe if you think about it from a purely mathematical standpoint, wouldn't surprise you so much, but to actually demonstrate it behaviorally is another matter. Um, so in the coloring and consensus experiments, remember we had this single parameter P, which at one extreme, when P is equal to zero, you're actually at the, the chain of cliques. And when P is equal to one, you really have a random graph, okay? And what these plots, which aren't showing well in this projector show, are the average experimental direction, the average time to find a global solution as a function of that parameter averaged across the many trials at each value of p here, okay? So basically, lower is better on this plot because it means on average the subjects are getting paid sooner. They're reaching the solution sooner. And this is the plot um, versus that parameter p of the difficulty of consensus as a function of p, which goes basically like this. And this is a plot of the difficulty of coloring as a function of that same parameter p, which goes like this, okay? And um, <clears throat> one, one high-level observation about that is that coloring overall was easier than consensus. So the, the sort of punchline would be, it seems to be easier to get people to disagree with each other than to agree with each other. Um, but there, but, but it, the, there's a statistically significant difference between these two curves, meaning you can establish that, you know, these problems really are harder than these problems and that these problems really are harder than these problems. So these curves are crossing. And so what that means is that even on the same family of networks, the, the two problems are eliciting opposite behavioral difficulty from the subjects as a function of that parameter, okay? And again, you can find simple algorithmic explanations for this happening, but to find it behaviorally is, I think, a, a, a striking finding. And I think it's, and, and this, of course, was part of the reason we did this experiment, to see whether something like this was, ha would happen. And if you're familiar at all with the vast literature on sort of social network, empirical social network structure, the reason I like this result is that um, a lot of that literature actually kind of ignores behavior or what's happening on the network, right? So you go look at, let's say, the network of who's trading with whom in a financial organization or who's exchanging messages with whom in a social network. And you then ignore what the task or what, what the subjects were doing or what the task was and just sort of report on the network structure. So what this is showing is a very clean example where you know, if you ask the question, well, is this family of network models, you know, harder or easier for subjects, that this result is showing that that question is meaningless 
without knowing the actual context of what the subjects were trying to do. And that, the, and, and that furthermore, the answer can be opposite, even when the two problems they're solving are, are you know, from the subject's viewpoint, the, the distance between graph coloring and consensus is epsilon, right? I mean, it's very easy to say to them, well, in, in these first experiments, you were trying to be a different color than all your neighbors. Now you're trying to be the same. And that just that, that despite that slight rephrasing, you're reversing the order of difficulty with respect to the structural parameter of the network. Um, this, ex, this plot over on the right, which is also um, a somewhat striking result and, and, and very thought provoking, although I don't claim to have you know, the only answer for, for what elicits it. Um, although I didn't mention it, in the very first coloring experiments, in a minority of the experiments on those initial six networks I showed you, we actually experimented around with how much information the subject saw. So in many of the experiments, they only had the local view that I showed you. But in another, in, there, was, there was sort of a low, a medium, and a high information condition. The low information condition was like what I showed you, but without even having the degree annotations on your neighbor. The medium information condition was basically what I described to you at the beginning. And in the high information condition, everybody saw everything. You, had, you did have a global bird's eye view of the network. Okay? So everybody really saw the entire network, and they saw themselves in a sea of 36 vertices. Okay? So, what this plot is showing is, as a function of whether the information view was the low, medium, or high information, the average solution time or difficulty of, first of all, the, cyclic, the cyclical networks, right? So not surprisingly, um, in the cyclical networks, right, when you show everybody the entire network and they see the simple cycle, for instance, everybody immediately gets what has to happen. And they can do this purposeful propagation of edges much more efficiently. And so you see that it helps, it doesn't help much to, to, you know, in the cyclical networks to have the degree information because actually the degrees don't convey a lot of information even in the ones with the cords. But there's a huge reduction in the solution time when you give them the full information view. The surprising thing is the, the results for pre the preferential attachment networks, which are the orange bars. Not only does it not get better, but the high information condition makes the collective performance radically worse. Okay? And, and so, of course, you can, you can spin many theories about this, right? One is, is sort of information overload, namely that um, when they can see the full network, even though their vertex is clearly identified, they kind of get you know, distracted by all the pretty blinking colored lights and don't attend properly. But there are other explanations as well. In particular, on the exit survey, some of the subjects reported on their exit survey that when they were in the high information condition, it made them more appreciative of the fact that even though you know, their, their local network had no conflicts, there were still things being worked out in other parts of the network. And they reported sort of being more patient. Okay? So this is different than being distracted. right? It's sort of making, it, you know, and, and may, it might still have a negative effect, as you can see in the results. But this is, is sort of um, trying to you know, be more thoughtful about how you move and how the propagation of results from other part of the network might affect your own local neighborhood. Yeah? So for a given task, do we talk about giving the, the, the change the network topology? Okay, so um, none of these experiments have done that, but the experiments, and maybe I'll say a bit about this, the, the experiments we're planning to do in May are actually going to be experiments in a network formation game. So the actual task of the subjects will be to create the network from scratch. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Okay. Did you, uh, when you gave the cycle, you gave the cycle looking like a cycle? We gave the cycle looking like a cycle, yes. Right, 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 right. So we gave the layout that, that made, and it's not clear, again, what would have happened if we gave them the cycle, but with some layout that completely hid the structure of the cycle. Yeah. Yes. No, no. So we, and, and we strictly proctor these experiments. We tell them to behave as if, as if, as if it's a final exam. Um, we tell them to, you know, no, no communication whatsoever. No groaning, no cheering, um, you know, nothing. Yeah, like with an actual like chat channel. Or, or even easier, I sometimes wonder what would happen if just before, after you describe the experiments to them, you say, okay, you can now have a five minute open conversation with each other to try to coordinate strategies and, and just see how different the results would be. But we haven't, haven't done that yet. I'm just talking just within the two graph structure, like the yeah. 
OK, so um, let me now go on and tell you a little bit about these experiments we did um, that were, were loosely inspired by the hotly fought Democratic primary of the last election. Um, so we actually internally called these the Democratic primary game because the, the feature of the Democratic primary, if you remember it, um, you know, it was, a, it was a very closely contested race between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And it was taking so long to sort of determine who the winner was going to be through the primary process that there actually started to be kind of hand wringing in the Democratic Party, right? Because the story was like, well, we don't want to push anybody out of the race prematurely, but while we're bickering with each other, um, you know, the McCain campaign is building out its national infrastructure. And so there were basically these calls of the forum, well, look, let's let this play out. But, you know, sort of every good Democrat has to agree that once we decide who the winner is, you'll then rally behind the winning candidate and sort of put, you know, put, put um, animosity behind. So our cartoon version of that is a consensus game. So, but now there's only two colors, red and blue, OK? Um, and again, as before, you, know, you have the same sort of um, local information view. You just have to choose red and blue. But now, so everybody gets paid only if there's global consensus. You have to have absolute unanimity. So if we all converge to red, we all get paid something. If we all converge to blue, we get paid something. If 35 of us are red and one of us is blue, everybody gets nothing. Okay? So this is the extreme version of the tension between um, individual preferences and collective, um, uh, co you know, co collective consensus. But the, but the rub here right, is that we all might care about which color we converge to. So some parties might have a payoff like this. If we all converge to blue, you get $1.25. If we all converge to red, you get 75 cents. Other people in the same experiment and the same network might have the reverse of these. So everybody basically has their own preferred color. They get a higher payoff for one of the two, but they still prefer their lower payoff color to getting nothing by having any kind of disagreement in the network whatsoever. OK? OK, so this, this is the structure of the game. Um, and uh, here are the networks that we generated, and I'm showing you them. In, there, there, are, there are nine of them here, and they're in two different layouts. Um, these, these six in the middle here um, are what we called cohesion experiments. And, and so here I'm sort of showing you a traditional layout, and here I'm showing you layouts where I've separated um, the parties according to their preferred or higher payoff color. Okay? So in these cohesion experiments, there are 18 that get a higher payoff for red and 18 to get a higher payoff for blue. And what we're varying in this network is the ratio of basically inter to intra group connectivity. Okay? So at one extreme, you mainly have edges to other people with the same preferred color as you, and a minority of your edges would go across to the other group. Um, in the middle, it's balanced. At the other extreme, most of your edges go to parties of the other preference. So um, by the way, in these experiments, Invariably, what happens is we queue up the next experiment, and you see your local network structure. And there's about a three-second delay before the, the, the panel actually becomes live. And what you hear during those three seconds, if you're in the room during these experiments, is this sort of rush of, of rapid mouse clicks as everybody in that three-second interval right before the start is just hammering on their preferred color to try to get their preferred color logged in the system and showing to their neighbors in the milliseconds right after the interface becomes live, presumably on, on the thinking that this might have a better chance of influencing what, what actually happens to the, in the outcome. But in these, in these extreme networks, right, um, in such a setting, Everybody can wake up at the start of the experiment with the experience that they're, everybody perceives themselves as being in the minority, even though it's a 50-50 split. Okay? And the difference between these three and these three is just whether the internal structure of these networks was generated according to preferential attachment or um, an erdos renyi model. These minority power experiments are, are maybe the most interesting ones we did in this session. In these ones, we generated a network according to pre preferential attachment, which again generates this heavy tail degree distribution. And in, in all these experiments, a majority of players preferred red and a minority preferred blue. In some cases, the vast majority preferred red. This is 30 that preferred red and only six that preferred blue. But in every case, we chose the blue players, not arbitrarily, but to be the vertices with highest degree. So this is a sort of you know, very, very controlled test of the question, can a small but well-connected minority systematically basically impose their, their will on the collective outcome, even though everybody else would prefer red? 
Okay. Okay. So you know, um, quick summary of some of the findings. Again, I invite you to go look at the paper. Um, first of all, again, people did pretty well, although these were among the harder, you know, if you remember my earlier reports about being sort of 88% efficient, this is definitely on the lower end of all the sessions we've done. 55 out of 81 of these experiments um, reached consensus within the one minute that we allotted for these experiments. Um, in general, you can find in all these experiments, um, and I won't go into details, in all these experiments, you can verify um, effects of network structure. So in other words, you can in a statistically meaningful way assert that the collective performance was different in one family of networks than another. So for instance, there was definitely differences in the difficulty for the subjects in terms of collective payoff and performance between the minority, I mean between the preferential attachment um, cohesion experiments, the erdish renin cohesion, and the minority power. Um, um, but in particular, Right, um, it, it is the case, right, that um, it, it was the case that uh, the um, minority power experiments did show this effect of a small minority influencing the outcome. So, in particular, of the 27, ex we ran 27 experiments where there was a minority that preferred one color and a majority that preferred the other, but the minority was the well connected one. Um, 24 of those 27 resulted in a successful unanimous outcome. All 24 of those 27, the, the outcome at the end was the minority preference, okay? So the majority didn't manage to get its way in even one of those experiments, right? And, um, and you can, and this is sort of a screenshot of a, of a series of, 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 of um, a screenshot of a series of views of one experiment where that's happening. Um, other interesting things that you can establish statistically from the data um, are that there's sort of a value to extremists. So what I mean by that is, um, although I didn't mention it, um, in, uh, uh, in, in some experiments, the incentives were always symmetric, meaning that I might prefer red, you might prefer blue, but our higher payoff colors give us the same higher payoff and our lower payoffs give us a lower. By asymmetric, I mean an experiment where, let's say, I'm paid $1.50 for red and only 50 cents for blue, and you're at $1.2575. So the difference between your payoffs is larger than mine. So in some sense, I should care more. So it turns out that all other things being equal, including network structure, there seems to be a value in having a certain fraction of the population be extremists in the sense that they're, they care a lot more. Their higher payoff is much higher than their lower payoff. And one theory for why this is so that you can find some evidence in the data of is it makes them more stable, right? It makes them more stubborn, right? And you can think about why this might have value from a dynamical perspective, right? It's that if everybody's jumping around too much and is, is too weak in their conviction or their stability in sticking with a color, it can just amount, uh, result in a fair amount of oscillation and difficulty in coordination. Whereas if you have a handful of participants in the network, who really, really want their higher payoff because it's much higher than their lower payoff, they can act as kind of anchors that the rest of the population will organize their behavior around. I think there was a... That's right. That's exactly right. It was, I thought there was a question, but... There are two possible payoffs. And the one they reach is smaller. Well, it's the smaller for the minority, right? So, the, so there are six parties that get a higher payoff for blue and 30 that get a higher payoff for red. And the consensus is going to the minority's preference of blue. No, because it's overall the this, 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 this is just how we choose to generate the colors. I should make them consistent, but, but, but go ahead. Right. That's right. So you can think of these as um, you, another way of putting it in econ terms, right, is that the this, this social welfare was far from the maximum. The maximum social welfare would be that we all choose the preference of the 30 that would prefer red and that the six blue guys get paid their lower payoff. Here in these experiments, in all 24 of them, the reverse happened. Okay, so these are, these are deep, deep suboptimal social welfare states that they're finding. Okay. Um, all right, let me just say a few 
last words about um, uh, another set of experiments we did on independent set. Um, so how do you sort of fool human subjects into um, trying to solve, find, find large independent sets in a network? So, and there were a couple of details about this that were slightly different. So we call this, we call this game kings and pawns. So maybe focus on this left interface first. So in these experiments, um, it, all you have to do at each moment in time is decide whether you're a king or you're a pawn. And basically, asserting that you're a king is like electing yourself to be a member of the independent set. And electing, uh, choosing to be a pawn is choosing to not be in the independent set. And here's the way the payoffs work. Basically, the highest rate of pay that you can get is by being a king with no neighboring kings, right? Because this is sort of the independent set criterion. You can't have two adjacent people in the independent set. So by, if you're a king and you don't have any king neighbors, you get the highest rate of pay. Um, alternatively, you can choose to be a pawn and get an intermediate but lower rate of pay unconditioned on what your neighbors are doing. Okay? But if you choose to be a king and you have a neighboring king, both of you get zero. Okay? And in these games, unlike the other games I've described where there was sort of a payoff event at the end, um, here we wanted to avoid kind of a brinksmanship or chicken situation where it's a two minute time limit, everybody selects to be a king, sits there for two minutes doing nothing, and then it's like who's going to blink at the end and back off and be a pawn. So to get rid of that, we went in these experiments to sort of a taxi cab allocation method. It's continuous payoffs. So basically there's a rate, there's a highest rate of pay, which I guess here is a dollar a minute. So for every for every second or millisecond that you're in the state that you've selected to be a king and none of your neighbors have selected that, you get a dollar a minute prorated by whatever amount of time you're in that state. Similarly, if you choose to be a pawn, you're getting 50 cents a minute. But it's continuously accruing, so there's no sort of a chicken game um, forced at the last two minutes. Okay? Okay, so, so again, the maximum social welfare states of this game are the max independent sets. Okay, and so this, this is the interface and the description about the game. Now, in every experiment we did in, in the model that I just described to you, there was a sibling experiment with a different mechanism, with a more complicated mechanism. And then let me describe that mechanism by the interface. The motivation for this variation is that if I'm a king and all of my neighbors are pawns, and I'm therefore getting the highest rate of pay higher than all of the pawns, it is their very pawnness that is making my kingness possible. And perhaps I should be grateful for that fact and be able to reward my pawns for allowing me to be a king. So everything was just the same as I described, but now there's a little slider down at the bottom, which when you're in the, the, the non-conflicting king state getting that highest rate of pay, you can set this slider to any 10% increment. And basically during the, that period, whatever income you make, this percentage of it will be evenly divided among your neighbors. Did they know that this came from you? Um, they knew, yes, they, they, they know what rate. Um, they, they, know, you, they know that it came from you and not from some other. That's, they, well, they can see for all of their neighbors what the rate of tipping looks like. OK? So, so you, you, know, you know who's paying higher rates. We now, No, you don't see that. You don't see that. But, but one thing that changes about this game, right, is that now it could be the case that for certain players, you can get an even higher payoff than the lone king rate by being a pawn. Because if you're, think about it, if you're a very high degree vertex, it might be quite unlikely that you'll, you'll, you won't have king neighbors all the time, okay? And, but, if, but if you got, you know, so think about like, you know, a hub and spoke network. So, you know, the optimal solution is that all of the, spokes choose to be kings and the hub chooses to be a pawn, now that, that hub might be able to get a very high rate of pay by getting small side payments from all of its neighbors. Okay, okay so you know, this, these were the experiments we did. Here were the networks that we ran them on. Again, a somewhat shotgun collection or smorgasbord of many different generative models. These are kind of samples from each of the families. Um, so, oh man, this, the, this is not coming out well in this projector, but I'll, I'll try to talk you through it. So basically, this is showing you for every single little two-minute experiment what the actual average you know, payoff was on a, on a per-player basis, on a per-minute basis, per-player-per-minute basis, 
um, in the tip in the setting when there were no side payments, the first configuration, and when there were side payments, which is this one. So this is a particular network structure, and it says that you know something like you know 42 cents a minute was made here, and something like 47 cents a minute was here. And you can't see the most striking thing about this plot, which is if you could see the shading on the diagram, we've also drawn in, um, you know, we've drawn in the diagonal, right, um, which basically starts here at the zero point. It's, it's not actually along the diagonal because we wanted to show you other things in this plot. But the diagonal runs from here, you know, along up to here. So the first finding, right, is that uniformly in every single experiment we ran, the social welfare increased when these side payments were allowed, okay? Every single, every single experiment, and in some cases, quite significantly so, right? So in some cases, there's something like a, um, you know, a, a, a double digit per cent, I mean, uh, per player or per minute um, raise in their, in their income, okay? Now, the other thing, the other interesting shaded rectangle that you can't see is the one that sort of runs from 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, because everything down here in this corner are things where the average payoff was actually lower than what we all would have gotten if everybody just played pawns the entire time. Okay? So these are, these are sort of deeply irrational from an equilibrium perspective. Right? We're doing worse here in terms of average payoff per player than if we just all played pawns all the time. So th there's this very striking effect of a lift in social welfare as the result of this um, uh, as this of the result of this tipping or side payment mechanism. And so the question that I'm asking on the top of the slide is, well, what's the explanation for this? So, so one explanation that um, Matt Jackson, who's a well-known economist at Stanford, um, uh, when I told him this result, he says, oh, you know, this sounds kind of like an interesting networked version of what's called the Coase theorem in economics, which to crudely and, and, and somewhat inaccurately summarize, basically predicts whenever there is sort of a negative externality for one group that can be alleviated by another group, the best way of doing, uh, the, the best way of allowing for this is to have an internal mechanism, a transfer of wealth mechanism between those two parties, okay? So it's like a pure rationality explanation for why at equilibrium you would be better off in the tipping mechanism than the non-tipping mechanism. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of these experiments, and we think about these things. You know, we're not we're not psychologists, but we definitely think about how you know we try to we try to do the minimum. I mean, the the, the goal of kings and pawns was, of course, to make it friendly, right, and not have to explain independent sets to them. Um, we generally try to do. Yeah, yeah, right. So, but but it is you know it, it is it is somewhat stigmatizing, um, and we try in general to avoid this. But I can't answer what might have happened if if we hadn't done that. So it turns out that, at least in our view, the explanation for this is not sort of the Coase theorem, economic rationality, i.e. Um, easing the transfer of a negative externality from the group that's inflicting it to the group that's suffering it, but there's a more behavioral explanation for it, which is that basically tipping is substituting for conflict. So if you look at the actual data from the mechanism where there's no side payments allowed, what you'll see there are many instances in which uh, um, individual subjects that have a king, a neighboring king, um, who's sort of not sharing the wealth in the sense that they're just sitting on king, you'll see players punish that party, right, by choosing to be a king themselves, which of course is irrational behavior from the payoff perspective, because given that you're a king, I should just go ahead and be a pawn, because then at least I'm getting paid 50 cents rather than nothing. So you don't see that. You see a great deal of conflict. You see many, many parties actively engaged in periodically choosing to be a king after somebody's already established themselves as a king in their neighborhood in order, presumably, to just punish and reduce payoff. And this is strongly backed up, of course, by the comments in the, in the exit surveys where people would say, well, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I, I did this frequently when I felt that somebody was, you know, and remember, the, the payoffs here are continuously accrued. When somebody was being king for too long, I would, I would conflict with them. But by the way, there were also interesting reports of essentially people inventing or replicating mixed strategies where they would essentially engage in a synchronized back and forth of swapping with king and non-king behavior. Um, th these were usually when their no local networks were quite simple in order to share the wealth of being a king and get each of us a, an average payoff of about 0.75 rather than one of us getting a dollar and the other one getting 50 cents. But what this plot is showing um, is 
Um, so basically, for each family of experiments, these are now averages over several networks, but with the same um, topological structure statistically. Um, so for each network family, if you like, for each topological family, there's a blue dot and an orange dot. And the blue dot is for the case where there were side payments allowed. The orange dots are where no side payments were allowed. And I'm plotting simultaneously two things. The average income disparity between neighbors, right? So go to every edge of the network and average over time what the difference in pay rate was between those two neighbors averaged over time during an ex the experiments, okay? And then, on, and so this is average income disparity between neighboring vertices. On the y-axis is how much conflict is taking place between those two neighbors. What's the fraction of time that both of them are in a king state and therefore are battling with each other to be a king, okay? And so the striking thing you see here, right, is that both of those measures are being radically reduced. And so the dotted lines here are between um, the same, same families of networks. These are preferential attachment trees in the no tipping, the tipping mechanism and the no tipping mechanism. And you can see that these two behavioral measures are simultaneously being reduced significantly when we allow side payments. The disparity in income is going down, so we're sharing the wealth better, and we're also not fighting with each other. So I think the explanation here is clearly a behavioral one, not a more traditional equilibrium explanation of transfer of wealth. Exactly, and in fact, on that point, one interesting side note is this little plot down here, which shows averaged over all players and over all the experiments in this session, where did they actually set this slider bar? What kinds of tips were they offering? And the reason I included this here is if you're familiar with the experimental results on two-player ultimatum games, where we have to split $10 and I get to propose the split, and then you have to either accept it or reject it, in which case we both get nothing, this, this distribution of, of tips here is remarkably similar to the distribution of offers you see in the ultimatum game. You see very little, you see a relatively sparse um, offers above 50%. So 50% seems to be a real dividing line, and the, the average is sort of like around 20 to 30%. Okay, so it does seem like there's, uh, again, that, that what seems to be this hardwired sense of fairness um, in the ultimatum game um, seems to have some vestige here as well. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, you see, by the way, in all these experiments, you'll see some fraction of really crazy behavior, right? So we've run bargaining game experiments where on each edge there's sort of a, a dollar to split, and we just have to agree on how to split that dollar. And you'll see people, you know, make, not just accept, but make offers where they give the entire dollar to the other person. And this is, again, remember, this is somebody that's anonymous, that they have no way of tracking throughout the experiment in, in any kind of expectation of repayment or, or the like. So, you know. Uh, so what? Well, you have to remember, okay, so these are Penn undergraduates doing this. And individually, every one of these, every little experiment doesn't give them that much. But, ba but basically, they're in a typical experimental session, these students are, you know, coming for, let's say, two and a half hours total with the sort of prep time and explanation and a demo game, et cetera, and then two hours of experimentation. And they're walking away with, you know, 50 to 100 bucks of payoff. So if you compare this to what I'm told by my friends who do behavioral psychology experiments, they're, they're, they tell me that the going rate is like $10 an hour for this kind of thing, right? So we are vastly overpaying. I mean, there's, there's a non-trivial amount of money at stake for these students, I think. So we definitely, and I mean, I haven't talked about it here, but a fair amount of the work we do, um, we, we, we're, we're, to the extent that it's possible to settle on any kind of single methodology for this, these very messy, diverse experiments, our general methodology is, you know, our very experimental design usually drives the first questions we ask. So we varied network structure. And the, the first thing we do is we say, is there a statistically meaningful correlation between network structure and the difficulty that subjects had or the payoffs they got, these sorts of things. And then we'll ask more refined questions about collective behavior, but eventually we'll get down to questions about individual level behavior. And one of the things, one basic question you could ask is, 
even without correlating it with, with performance, what dimensions of individual play exhibit meaningful variation? Okay, so what I mean by that is, you, you know, so a typical thing to do would be to invent some reasonable behavioral measure of some phenomenon you're interested in. So for instance, I might define, let's say in the, like the voting games, I might define stubbornness to be playing my preferred color even when, you know, some possibly strong majority of my neighbors are playing the opposite color, okay? So I can define a measure like that. I can call that stubbornness, right? And then I can go to every subject throughout the entire evening and just measure, come up with a number for what's the total amount of time they spent in what I'm defining to be a stubborn state. Then I can ask the question, well, I've got these 36 stubbornness values for the 36 subjects. And I can just look at that variation and ask, you know, and I won't go into detail about how you'd ask this, but you can imagine. I can ask, is the variation in that number larger than I would expect just by chance because of the random assignment to people in different positions in the network, for instance? And if the answer to that is yes, then there's an argument there that there are people in the population that are behaviorally different, that there are, that sort of personality traits are showing through, right? That you can sort of reliably say that the most stubborn people, there's something different about their actual personality, or as, at least as it's projected into this game, than the people with the lowest values, okay? And so one common step we'll take is to look at questions like that or measures like that. And then, of course, the next question is, like, once you, dis once you determine that, yes, some people are in a meaningful way more stubborn than others, is that positively, negatively, or not at all correlated with income, right? Because it could be that some people are much more stubborn and they're the ones that got the lowest payoffs, or it could be that they are the highest payoffs. And so if you go look at the papers, you'll see that we made a fair amount of effort to ask questions like that and, you know, and, and sort of try to find meaningful results along these lines. And, and by the way, this is sort of a first step at kind of coming towards richer behavioral models, right? Because you might imagine that um, rather than sort of taking generic heuristics like the one I mentioned for graph coloring at the beginning of the experiment, I might actually like to say, well, I want to have a parameter in strategies like that which actually represents something like um, stubbornness and have variation in that parameter, right? So it's, an, by the way, I mean, it's an, it, from a mathematical and from sort of an evolutionary game theory point of view, it's an entirely plausible conjecture that to solve these problems well, you really require a certain amount of diversity and strategy and variation along the lines of stubbornness. In the sense that if we're all too stubborn, in many of these games, obviously, whatever, for any meaningful notion of stubbornness, nobody will get paid. But in many of them, if you think about it, it, it it's also helpful to have a certain number of parties that are stubborn for a variety of reasons as well. One of them being that it can be kind of an anchor around which other parties can coordinate, okay? So I think it's an interesting question about distributed computation in general and human behavior more specifically, whether in lots of, um, you know, social problem solving scenarios, you need this diversity of personality in order to kind of um, achieve good results. Okay. Um, so let me stop here, you know, some high-level conclusions. Um, you know, one big one is that at least for three dozen subjects at a time, human subjects appear remarkably good across a diverse range of tasks and a diverse set of network topologies. One of the things I've been, I haven't dwelled on here, but you'll see in the papers, is that, you know, one of the concerns I had going in this line of experimentation is that because of the small samples, you know, small number of subjects, small number of actual experiments you can run in a session, that we were doomed to only ever reporting averages and never being able to assert statistical significance. And I've been pleasantly surprised that, you know, many of our findings you can put, you know, p-values on that are quite small. And I, I attribute this to the fact that despite the small samples that we're measuring effects that are, are fairly strong, at least in the experimental scenario we've set up. Um, and, you know, one interesting topic for offline discussion, of course, is you know, why do these things in a lab with 36 subjects? Why not do them on the open web with, you know, 360 or 36,000 or 36 million potentially? And I and others are, are interested in doing that. And, and um, Duncan Watts at Yahoo Research and one of my former students have tried replicating some of our experiments um, in an online setting, recruiting subjects through Amazon's Mechanical Turk service, which if some of you know about it, is this um, 
business, this sort of side business that Amazon explicably continues to run. I can't imagine it makes them any money, but it's basically an online labor market where, for instance, computer vision researchers will go put images and pay people a penny per image to label whether there's a car in them or not to get a data set to train um, a model for, you know, let's say, object recognition. So instead of viewing it as a labor market, you could actually view it as a subject pool instead. Um, there's all kinds of challenges of moving to the online world. One of them meaning that you lose control, but still subject recruitment, you know, to do exactly what you want to do, it may not be that easy to recruit subjects, right? I mean, if you somehow make it fun and get enough people to do it, then, so things like the ESP game, then that's great. But the main problem that Duncan and my former student Sid are having at, at Yahoo is that they can actually only get about 24 subjects, fewer than what we have, to simultaneously participate. Because, of course, there's this trade-off. You kind of say, well, we're starting a game, and then you wait to collect subjects. But if you wait too long, then the other subjects start leaving also. And so 24 seems to be about the most they can get before they actually start declining in, in subjects. But I think it's just a matter of time before large-scale social experiments start to take place on, on the web. And we just have to kind of figure out how, how to get there. So let me stop there, and we can continue over lunch. But, um, but thanks, and thanks for the great comments and questions. Right, right. Uh, and they are doing uh, zillions of experiments to understand various uh, social phenomena. In fact, social scientists, are, I guess, are doing it all the time. And you are, you are now in contact with this yeah. big community. Yeah. So uh, I, I expect that in, in many uh, experiments you run them and uh, there's nothing to learn. You don't have strong effects. I mean, others say uh, maybe you are looking at other or you are lucky. And then. Is there a methodology? design experiments. You could have designed, you could have chosen so many, but there are so many free parameters in your experiment. Yeah. So is there a methodology to design experiments in such a way that you'll be able to, you know, be lucky a lot? So I mean, learn, you know, really meaningful things so first of all, my first comment would be is that if there were such a methodology, it would be least likely to apply to the experiments we're doing, which are just so messy and has, have such a huge space. And I'll be honest with you, right? We have strong, interesting findings from every one of our experimental sessions, which is great. We haven't ever run an experimental session, m maybe one, um, which we then quickly followed up with a variation on it, that it because we saw sort of what the problem was. Um, but, you know, and so that's been great on the one hand. On the other hand, it, it's probably a sign that I'm over-constraining the experiments, right? That, that, that I'm, I'm kind of putting people in such constrained settings that there's a certain inevitability that certain things that I'm looking for will happen, and that's probably not a good thing. Um, but, you know, I've, I've spent lots of time and been influenced by people like Colin Kammerer at Caltech who, you know, wrote, literally wrote the book on behavioral game theory. And I have asked him questions like this, like, which is, you know, how do you decide what to do? Now, in certain areas of behavioral game theory, there's like so much literature on one narrow set of experiments, like Ultimatum Game, that there are sort of incremental questions that are very interesting to ask, you know. So, in other words, once we've done dozens and dozens of American university laboratory experiments in Ultimatum Games, you know, somebody gets the bright idea, let's go to, you know, non-Westernized cultures that might have little contact with Western, you know, traditions and see if they behave differently, right? Uh, 